Good morning. Is it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Thank you for being here today. It has been especially uh, rejuvenating and uh, filling to be here with you, to see uh, our church family, to be with church family, and to enjoy uh, the presence of God's Holy Spirit within each who are born again, and to fellowship with you and with the Spirit at the same time. We thank God for this time and opportunity now to open the Lord's Word. We are, as Brother Thomas just read in John chapter 16, verses 5 through 15. John 16, verses 5 through 15. Jesus is continuing his teaching, his instruction to his disciples, his apostles, there in the upper room, the night when Jesus is betrayed. They will leave out of this room shortly. They will be going to the Mount of Olives where Jesus will pray. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there Judas with a band of soldiers will come, betray him with a kiss. And Jesus will be led away to appear before the trial where he will be convicted falsely by malicious liars. And then the next morning he will be crucified. And so Jesus is telling his disciples that he is going away. He is going away. And he is preparing them for his departure, what they can expect in his departure. We still live in that time. We live during that season right now where Jesus is away, where Jesus is with the Father Jesus is actually going to explain to his disciples that it is advantageous for them, thus it is also advantageous for us that Jesus is with the Father right now because having gone to the Father, Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit into this world. There is much confusion about the Holy Spirit, and it is really confusion that is based on ignorance. Many people, unfortunately, supply their ignorance not with knowledge, but with imagination. They supply their ignorance with imagination and with invention, and they say all manner of things about the Holy Spirit that is not true. And in fact, they develop full theologies about someone they call the Holy Spirit, and they're not teaching about the true Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. They're just not. What we want to do this morning is we want to see what God's Word says about the Holy Spirit. This comes right in the flow of Jesus' teaching there in the upper room. And right here in John 16, 5 through 15, what I want to talk to you about is the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. What you see here is not an exhaustive explanation or listing of the work of the Holy Spirit, but you do see three aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit. Three aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus here mentions nothing about the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. He's already spoken about the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 3 when he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. It's the Spirit, he says in John 6, who gives life. And the flesh is no help at all. We understand that the Holy Spirit does a regenerating work. That is, he makes you brand new. It's not merely a reviving work. So many people pray for revival when really what they need to pray for is regeneration. They don't need to be made alive again. They were never made alive in the first place. They need to be regenerate. They need to be born again, to be born of the Holy Spirit. When you're born of the Holy Spirit, you have a new heart, new affections. You have a new mind. Your thoughts are different toward God. You have a love for God, a desire to obey him from the heart, and you are indwelt by his Holy Spirit. But we'll not talk any further about the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit because in this passage, that's not Jesus' focus. 
In this passage, he's going to tell us three aspects, three different aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit. And my goal when we look at this passage is not to be complex, it's not to be complicated. I want you to understand this passage of the Bible. I want you to understand this passage of scripture. And I wanna teach you, by way of explaining, I want to teach you how to better read your Bible. I realize I say this to you every week, but I want it to become plain to all of us. The way that I'm walking through these passages of scripture is designed to aid you to do the same. It is designed to aid you to go through the same process when you read your Bible, asking questions. When he says that he is going to convict the world of sin, what do you mean convict? What does the word convict mean? I'm gonna go and look that up. I wanna understand what Jesus actually means. What does it mean that he's going to convict of sin? What does he mean he's going to convict of righteousness and convict of judgment? What does it mean that he's going to bear witness? What does it mean that he is going to glorify? And you ask these questions and you do the hard work and you will find great treasure in God's word by doing the honest work when you look at a passage of scripture. Hopefully the work I'm doing here helps you to do that on your own. What I want you to come away understanding, certainly in a more full sense than this sentence will convey, is at least the truth of this sentence. You might wanna write it down if you have a pen and take notes, and it's simply this. The Holy Spirit convicts the world. He convicts the world. He guides believers and glorifies Jesus. The Holy Spirit convicts the world, guides believers, and glorifies Jesus. Those are the three aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus speaks about here in John chapter 16, verses five through 15. The first thing that he does in verses five through 10 is he talks about the sending of the Spirit, the sending of the Spirit. And that is the sending of the Spirit in relation to Jesus' own departure from this world unto heaven. Then he moves from talking about the sending of the Spirit, verses 5 through 7, to verses 8 through 15, where he addresses the work of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit. There he speaks about those three aspects, a convicting work, a guiding work, and a glorifying work. A convicting work, a guiding work, and a glorifying work. Let's look at verses five through seven and speak about the the sending of the Spirit, the sending of the Spirit. It says in verse five, but now I am going to him who sent me. Who is it that sent Jesus? Well, the Father, the Father sent Jesus. And so Jesus is telling his disciples that now it's, it's come to the time where he is going to go back to the Father. But now I am going to him, to the Father who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? Now you might say in your mind, I, I remember that there were a number of questions that have been asked of Jesus already, even here in the upper room. These disciples have asked Jesus a number of questions. In John chapter 13, after Jesus has washed the disciples' feet, he he tells them, he says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. Just a little while. You will seek me. Where I am going, you cannot come. He's already told them that he's going somewhere that they cannot come. We understand when we looked at this passage that Jesus is not only speaking about going to the Father, but initially he is talking about going to the cross. He says, where I'm going, you cannot come. To which Peter responds and he says, Lord, where are you going? We say, well, there you go. There's somebody asking, Peter asked Jesus, where are you going? And yet now in chapter 16, he says, none of you asks, where are you going? How do these two things jive? Does that seem like a a bit of a contradiction? 
It would if you didn't pay attention to the context of when things are said. In John 13, Jesus is talking about going to the cross. He's not talking about going to the Father. So Peter says when Jesus is talking about going to the cross, well, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. And Peter will follow him afterward. Peter will be crucified. Peter will die in like manner to Jesus. And Peter will indeed be with the Lord in glory after he ascends to heaven. You remember that Thomas in chapter 14, Thomas, he says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? So Thomas here, he doesn't ask the Lord where he's going. He just acknowledges that he doesn't know. He doesn't know where the Lord is going. He says, how can we know the way? And to this, you already know the verse. You already know Jesus' response. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. So where is he going? He's going to the Father, and the only way there is not a path. It's a person. It's Jesus. There in chapter 14, just a couple of verses later, Philip Philip turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, show us the Father. Show us the Father, and that's enough for us. To which Jesus then responds and he says, Philip, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. But still, no one has asked him when he says, I'm going to the Father, no one has asked him, where is the Father? Where is he located? That doesn't seem to be the point of what Jesus is about to speak on because there's something else going on inside of the apostles. They don't think to ask that question because something else has overcome them. He says in verse six, but because I have said these things, these things about going away, but because I have said these things, sorrow has filled your heart. Your hearts are full of anxiety. You are perplexed. You're overwhelmed with sadness. Sorrow has filled your heart. Jesus, in talking about going away from them, has already acknowledged that sorrow has troubled them. And he tells them in John chapter 14, verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Here's Jesus saying, trust me. You're full of sorrow because I tell you I'm going away, because I tell you you can't follow me right now, because I say yet a little while and you will see me no more. And sorrow has filled your heart, but I need you to trust me. Trust me like you trust the Father, says Jesus. Because I've said these things to you, sorrow has overwhelmed you. Sorrow has consumed you. It has filled your heart. Nevertheless, don't be sad. Nevertheless, verse seven, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus says this is actually advantageous. In which time period of this world would you like to live? Given the opportunity, would you have loved to live during the days of Jesus? You know that it's actually advantageous for you to live during these days as opposed to those. Do you know that at that point, during the days of Jesus, believers in him were not filled with the Holy Spirit yet? When you read the Gospels, this makes perfect sense because you see the way the disciples go from this extreme amount of faith and trust, we'll die for you, to just a couple of hours later, 
denying Jesus? Why is there such inconsistency in their life? Why is there such a great difference in the ebb and flow of their faith? They're not filled with the Holy Spirit yet. And Jesus says in his absence, in his going to the Father, he is going to send someone. He is going to send someone that he calls here the helper. In the Greek, that word is parakletos, the helper, a comforter, one who comes alongside and encourages, who helps by consoling, giving strength, and even mediating. In Greek literature, when you read about a parakletos, a lot of times you are reading about an attorney. You're reading about someone who acts on your behalf in your best interest. Someone defending you, someone helping you, someone guiding you, someone leading you. Someone with far greater experience and expertise than you, advocating on your behalf because you are in a difficult situation. Jesus says to his disciples, it is to your advantage that I go away because such a person is going to come to you. The comforter, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, here he calls him the helper. The helper is going to come to you. Jesus first spoke in John's gospel of the coming of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7. Then in John chapter 14, Jesus spoke of the coming of another helper, which speaks of a helper that was there with them presently. During Jesus' incarnation, he was the help of the disciples. He was the comforter of the disciples. He is the, the guidance for the disciples. But in his absence, will they be orphaned? Will they not be led? Will they not be comforted? they will actually have even closer of a relationship in Jesus' absence. When Jesus was with them, he was with them. When the Holy Spirit comes, he would not merely be with them, he would be within them. This is such a wonderful truth, a wonderful and comforting promise that God manifests his presence in the person of his Holy Spirit, not just with us, but within us. And his Holy Spirit is sent into the world to do wonderful work. The Holy Spirit is not an, an animating life force. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal being. The Holy Spirit ought never be referred to as an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit ought to be referred to as he. The Holy Spirit is God. It is God's Holy Spirit. Many times in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, the helper, the advocate, the mediator. Here is the Holy Spirit, the person of God, sent into the world. And as Jesus first spoke in John 7 of the sending of this other helper, and in John 14... Then in Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells his disciples... As he is going to ascend to heaven, he tells his disciples, he says, remain in Jerusalem until the promise of the, whole, of, of the Father, the promised Holy Spirit comes upon you. You read in that second chapter of the book of Acts, in fact, the first two of those chapters, that the disciples remain in the upper room. And they're there waiting in Jerusalem and they're all gathered together and they are praying. And suddenly from heaven there comes a mighty rushing sound and the apostles, the disciples, those who are in that room are filled and indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And suddenly you see one of the works of the Holy Spirit coming about in their life. Whereas beforehand they were cowardice, they're filled with courage. 
And then they begin to do the very work that Jesus is going to speak about in a moment. And they go out into the city and they glorify Jesus by the power of the Spirit. They declare the truth of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they, in fact, even do many miracles and wonders and signs by the power of the Holy Spirit to confirm the truth that they are declaring. Jesus says here, if I go away, I will send him to you. In the New Testament, we read that the Holy Spirit is sent by Jesus. We also read that the Holy Spirit is sent by the Father. Which one is it? Yes, Jesus is sent by the Father and the Son. You know this? You know that the Father and the Son never behave differently than one another? They always behave in concert with one another, in unison with the will of God, both of them carrying it out. And so here we see Jesus claiming, I'm going to send the Spirit. Other places, the Father is going to send the Spirit. Yes, the Father and the Son send the Spirit. Where was the Holy Spirit before the Father and the Son sent him into the world? John chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus actually told us. He says, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. That the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father speaks of the Spirit's nearness to the vicinity of the Father. The Holy Spirit has always been right there at the Father's side. Just as Jesus, for all eternity past, was right there with the Father. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Three entirely unique, distinct persons, yet in perfect, holy unity. And you see God, you see God working out this wonderful, marvelous plan that is designed in the mind of God and according to the wisdom of God to fulfill his purpose where the triune God sends from the presence of the Father first the Son. The Son is sent into the world. You read about this in John chapter 3. For God loved the world in this way that he gave his only Son. God sent his Son into the world. And Jesus carries out this first part of the redemptive work, the redemptive plan of God. Jesus lives a sinless life in this world. Jesus then dies the death that we deserve as the sacrifice for our sins. He fulfills the law of Moses in this way, and he brings about a new covenant. And after Jesus is raised up from the dead, he ascends to the Father, but there's still more work in the plan of God to be accomplished. This is not work at this point that Jesus is carrying out. Now it's work that the Holy Spirit is carrying out. And the work that the Holy Spirit is carrying out is the finishing of this work of redemption, the application of this work of redemption. And this work is broken up here in this passage in three different aspects. There's a convicting work. There's a guiding work. And then there's also a glorifying work. You read of these three in verses 8 through 15. Now let's look at the work of the Spirit. Jesus says, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. This is the first of these three aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit. You can write this down. I'll tie it together neatly for you and essentially just repeat the verse for you because it's stated so succinctly. The Holy Spirit, aspect number one, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It is right and good for us to repeat what the Bible teaches 
to believe exactly what the Bible teaches. Friends, you don't have to add to that statement at all. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Where there is no conviction of sin, you can be guaranteed the Holy Spirit is not at work. Where there is no conviction of righteousness, you can be guaranteed there, there is no work of the Holy Spirit. When there is no conviction of the judgment of the ruler of this world and the judgment to come on those of the world, you can be guaranteed in that place there is no work of the Holy Spirit. Now, without going into a long and feisty diatribe here, I want you to examine when you listen to preaching and teaching in this world, I want you to listen for the marks of the work of the Holy Spirit. In that preaching, in that teaching, is there conviction of sin? Is there conviction of righteousness? Is there a conviction of the judgment that is coming upon this world? If those three are not present, you can be guaranteed that that is not preaching led by the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to convict in these three ways, sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now let's look at these each in turn, but understand that they, these are modifiers of a verb. Convict. He will convict the world. The word convict is the word elegco, elegco. And here's what the dictionary definition in a Greek lexicon says. It is to state that someone has done wrong with the implication that there is adequate proof of such wrongdoing and generally with the suggestion of shame of the person convicted. Let me read that again. Conviction means this, to convict. It means to state that someone has done wrong. That's just about the only kind of sin this world counts, is telling someone that they have done wrong. This is what the Spirit does. He states that someone has done wrong with the implication that there is adequate proof of such wrongdoing. That is, he tells people, you are wrong. And he brings to mind the things that they have done as adequate proof to call them guilty. And then it is generally with the suggestion of shame upon the person being convicted. The world hates the work of the Holy Spirit. The world hates the work of the Holy Spirit. The world does not want to be told that it is wrong. The world does not want to be shown proof of its wrongdoing. And the world certainly does not want to be shamed for their wrongdoing. You know that the world is at war against the work of the Holy Spirit. This is precisely why the homosexual movement in the world has a month called Pride Month. Because those living in a sinful life they feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, you are wrong. They sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, here is the proof of your wrongdoing. And they sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, you ought to be ashamed of the way that you are behaving. And so the world rises up gathers in a group and presses against the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. They don't want to be told that what they're doing is wrong. They don't want people saying, and here's the proof. And they don't want to be feeling ashamed for what they're doing. 
Now that's not just applicable to those in the living in homosexuality. That's applicable to men who consistently skip church to go fishing. They don't want to be told where they need to be. They don't want to be made to feel bad. That's for people who consistently miss church. They forsake the assembling of God's people to play sports or to engage in dance or pageants or whatever the myriad of things. It's for the person who spends all of their time working for money and never gives their time to the Lord or to serve other people. Don't want to be told that they're wrong. Friends, I don't like to be told that I'm wrong. And there, there are certainly times that I am wrong and I, I don't like it. And my flesh wants to push against that. But thanks be to God that he changes our heart and he gives us the ability to receive his precious rebukes. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And the Holy Spirit has his precious way of wounding us when we are in sin and convicting us of sin, showing us the proof and giving us a taste of the shame that we ought to feel before God. And suddenly we begin to realize that in so many ways we are not in any way unlike our forefather Adam and our grandmother Eve who knew they were wrong, who hid from God and in their shame they covered their nakedness with fig leaves. When God came to the garden, what did God do? He called Adam out and said, Adam, where are you? He made Adam own up to the fact that he was hiding from God. And he said, Lord, I'm here. I hid from you. Adam, what did you do? God knew. God was not seeking information. He was seeking an admission. Adam, what did you do? He says, we took of the fruit and ate. And he still tried to pawn it off. He says, the woman you gave me, the woman you gave me, she took of the fruit and ate, and then she gave it to me. And God took their shame and God took an animal and God himself made the first sacrifice. And he killed that animal and he took those skins and he properly covered the shame of their nakedness. This is how God so wonderfully and gently and kindly deals with us through the work of the Holy Spirit. But that same work that softens the heart of believers is the same work that hardens the heart of the unbeliever. The world hates being told that it's wrong, that it ought to feel shame, that it ought to be convicted in its heart for doing what is wrong. And that's why you see such a passionate uprising amongst groups of people participating in such heinous sins and they don't want to feel the shame that they already feel in their heart. They're certainly ashamed. They just don't want to admit it. And that's not a comment directed solely at people who claim to be homosexual. That's a, claim, that's a comment directed at all people in this world who don't want to be told that they are wrong. So what does the Lord convict of through his Holy Spirit? It says that he convicts, he calls out with adequate proof and mixes in a little shame with it. He calls people out for sin. That is what is wrong. This is what hamartia means. It's a violation of God's law. It's a violation of God's design. But he not only convicts of sin, he also convicts of righteousness. Dikaiosune, it means to walk in accordance with God's law, to keep God's law, literally to live as one ought to. So the Holy Spirit not only tells us what we ought not do, 
He also convicts us of what we ought to do. He convicts of sin. He convicts of righteousness. He convicts of judgment. Here's the wrong thing that you're doing. Here's the right thing that you ought to be doing. And if you don't repent and turn, here's the judgment that's coming upon you. The condemnation that is coming upon you. So he convicts of sin. The Holy Spirit comes, this is what he will do. Convict of sin. Now look a little more closely now at verse nine because each of these, conviction of sin, conviction of righteousness, conviction of judgment, Jesus gives a brief, a brief explanation of what he means. He says in verse nine, concerning sin because they do not believe in me. This first work that the Holy Spirit does is conviction of sin. You realize that this is the work that John the Baptist was doing? When John the Baptist came onto the scene preaching and preparing the way for Jesus, what did he preach? He said, repent. That's a summary form of saying, you're wrong, here's what's right, and you need to change it. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Judgment is here. When Jesus comes onto the scene for the entirety of his ministry, what does he do? He tells the world that its deeds were evil. Jesus says this to his own brothers in John chapter seven, verse seven. He says, the world cannot hate you, But it hates me, why? Because I testify about it that its works are evil. Jesus is the one who was preaching about sin and telling people to repent. In the Sermon on the Mount, what is Jesus doing? He's not only declaring the way of righteousness, He's also giving a discourse about what is sinful and what must be stopped. And he says that the Holy Spirit here in verse nine, he convicts the world of sin, why? Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will convict the world of their wrongdoing, their breaking of God's commandments because they do not believe in me. I tell you, this is a gracious work of God. You realize that God could leave the world in its unbelief without conviction of their sin and let the world devour itself and then go into judgment and spend an eternity in hell without ever feeling like what they did was wrong. But he says, no, the Holy Spirit, when he comes into the world, he's gonna convict the world of sin because they do not believe in me. That means they need to believe in Jesus. And if they're not convicted of their sin, friends, if you don't talk about sin, how can a person repent of it? If you don't talk about a person's sin and their need to turn from sin unto faith in Jesus, how will they ever believe? So this is the work that the Holy Spirit does. He convicts of sin because people don't believe and they need to believe. But the first step of belief is their confession of sin. Look at John 3, 16 through 18 with me. You'll see it right here. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him, whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. That's why they need to be convicted. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. John 3, 36, same passage. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son, so to disobey the Son is called what? That's called sin. 
Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. What a gracious work that God has done sending his Holy Spirit into the world to convict people of sin. The world is already condemned, but the world can escape condemnation. The world can escape condemnation through the first step, which is conviction, conviction of sin. Friend, if you feel convicted of your sin, don't push back. Give in to it, accept it. The first thing that a person must do in coming to faith to Jesus is admit that they are wrong and they actually need a savior. How will you ever say, God, forgive me, if you don't admit that you actually need forgiveness? And when you feel convicted of sin, don't get mad at the messenger. When you feel convicted of sin, own up to the guilt. The Lord is doing that not to make you feel bad as an end in itself. The Lord is doing that to lead you to repentance. When you feel conviction, own it. Own it and admit it. I've said this to you a number of ways and many times through the years. The way up with God is down. In order to go up with God and to be found in him, you got to go down on your knees. You got to be humbled. You've got to own your sin and ask for forgiveness. He convicts the world of sin because they do not believe me. Verse 10, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. When Jesus was preaching on the earth during his incarnation, not only was he calling people out and the world out for its sin, he was also convicting of righteousness. He was saying, this is the way God wants you to live. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who weep and mourn, Blessed are those, those who are lowly in heart. And he, he calls people to this way of righteousness. He is telling people, this is who God wants you to be. God wants you to be merciful. God wants you to be lowly in heart. God wants you to be pure with your eyes and with your mind and with your emotions. This is the way of righteousness. This is the way God wants you to live. You see, God is not interested only in telling people what they're doing is wrong. The goal is that people turn from their wrongdoing and then do what is right. And again, I'll tell you, the world does not want to be told what is right. And this is why the, the world has adopted such a foolish statement of relativity saying, what's right for you is right for you, and what's right for me is right for me. There's one standard of righteousness, and that is God's standard of righteousness. Now let me ask you the question, how does the Holy Spirit tell the world what is right? You know that the Holy Spirit is never recorded in the Bible as speaking audibly. How does the Holy Spirit tell the world what is right and what God demands? How has the Holy Spirit done this work from the beginning of his coming into the world? I'll tell you, it is through the preaching and the teaching of the church and the testimony of the members of the church. The Holy Spirit guiding and leading preachers and teachers and members of the church to tell the world what is right, to tell the world what is right wrong. This is why the church in Paul's epistles is called a pillar and a buttress of the truth. The church pushes back and holds fast against the pressures of the world and stands as a standard of truth telling the world what is wrong and telling the truth to the world what is right. Listen to this charge the apostle Paul gives to young Timothy and to all preachers who come after him. 2 Timothy chapter Four verses one through five. The apostle writes, I charge you, preacher, 
in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. And what that means is this. Be ready when people will receive the teaching and preaching and continue doing it when they won't receive it. Be ready in season and out of season. Here's what you do. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is the responsibility of the preaching and teaching ministry of the church. It is to be the mouthpiece of the Holy Spirit, preaching God's word, calling the world to repent of sin and to turn to righteousness warning the world of the judgment to come. You see this is this third part of this first aspect. He says concerning judgment, verse 11, because the ruler of this world is judged. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. You see Jesus at the end of verse, verse 10 says the Holy Spirit is going to do this work because he himself, Jesus, will no longer be there with them. The Holy Spirit is going to pick up the ministry of Jesus where he left off, convicting the world of sin, convicting the world of righteousness, and now convicting the world of judgment. Why? Because the ruler of this world is judged. You remember what conviction means. It means to tell someone of their wrongdoing, providing sufficient or adequate evidence and mixing in there's the suggestion of shame. The evidence of God's righteous judgment coming into the world is the judgment that he has already brought upon the ruler of this world. When Jesus came into the world and he was casting out demons, what was he doing? He was pronouncing judgment upon Satan. He was pronouncing judgment on those demons and he was casting them out. He was taking territory. He was laying claim to the earth. There at the end of Jesus' incarnation, as he is about to go into heaven, what does Jesus say in Matthew 28? He says that now all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth all authority, that the earth is no longer under the authority of the ruler of this age, Satan. The world is under the authority of Christ, and it's the church's job to go into the world, therefore, and to make disciples. Now, how do we see that in Jesus that the ruler of this world is judged, as he says here in verse 11? In John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus has already said this. He says, now is the judgment, same word, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Here, Jesus is speaking specifically about his work that he's going to do on the cross. That when Jesus goes to the cross, he is going to disarm Satan. He is going to remove his ability to do the things that he has done from the beginning. He's going to disarm him, he is going to shame him, and this is the beginning of Satan being cast out into the lake of fire. The Apostle Paul summarizes it well in Colossians chapter two, verse 13 through 15. He says this, and you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him, with Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses. How did he do it? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. In this way, he says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That is, on the cross, 
Jesus put Satan to open shame because he has rendered him now toothless and clawless in his accusations. Now, when Satan says of me, you are a sinner, I say, I know. And when he says before God, Jordan is a sinner, God says, I know. But his debt's paid. Be gone with you. He's put to shame. He has nothing over me. He has nothing at all. He no longer has the power of accusation unto condemnation. He no longer has the power over me of the fear of death. You can kill my body, but I will rise in the likeness of Jesus. And he no longer has authority over the kingdoms of this earth. That authority belongs to Jesus. You saw that, as I said, in Matthew 28, verse 18, as Jesus says, all authority has been given unto Unto me. And Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 on, we see that Jesus himself is given the name above every name. Jesus is given the name of Lord. Satan is not Lord of this earth. This is my Father's world, and this is Jesus' kingdom. Jesus rules this world. And the time of Satan being cast out has already taken place and will culminate at the return of Jesus. If Satan is judged and condemned. God did not pass over his sin. Will God not also judge this world and its sin and condemn the world and its sin? Yes, he will the work of the Holy Spirit to warn the world of this coming judgment. What a beautiful work that God has given his spirit. He comes into the world and he says, y'all are wrong for the way you're living. There's a right way to live and it's the way of God. And if you don't repent and turn from your sin, you will be judged in the same way that Satan was judged. Friends, this is a redemptive work. This is a glorious and a kind and a gracious work that God accomplishes through his Holy Spirit. You know, that's not the only work, though. He not only convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment, he also guides believers into all the truth. This is the second aspect of his work that Jesus mentioned here. The Holy Spirit guides believers into all the truth. So he does a convicting work. He does a guiding work. Now, when we talk about Jesus guiding believers into all the truth, you need to understand that this is both a completed work and a continuing work in a sense. It's a completed work and it's a continuing work. It's a completed work in the sense that this passage specifically and initially is directed towards the apostles, those who wrote the New Testament. And Jesus' promise here initially is to the apostles that the Holy Spirit will guide them into all truth and they will bear witness about him. Listen to what Jesus already said in chapter 14, verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. John 15, 26 through 27. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So here is this special work of the Holy Spirit, which has been completed at this point. It's the special work of inspiration where the Holy Spirit taught the apostles, the disciples, exactly what they ought to say and write down, and you have that text right here in your hands. This is how you know that it is inerrant, it is dependable, it is infallible, it is without error, and it is supremely authoritative in your life. Because it's not merely written by the hands of men, it is inspired by the Spirit of God. This is why in 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul describes God's Word as being breathed out by God. 
inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1 talks about the Holy Spirit carrying along these men as they write. Now, this work of this work of of guiding believers into all truth is not only a completed work of inspiration, it is also a continuing work of illumination. A continuing work of illumination. In that sense, what I mean is the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us understanding of the things of God. He makes it where when we read the Bible, you understand what it means. And not only do you understand, but you actually listen to it and obey it. The Apostle Paul speaks of it in this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Now, let's look back at the text here at verse 12 and see how Jesus explains all of this. He says in verse 12 through 13, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. There, Jesus is even speaking about this prophetic role that the apostles will fulfill. This work then that the Holy Spirit does is not only a completed work of inspiration of the apostles, it's also a continuing work of illumination where he gives us understanding in his word. Now, where does the Holy Spirit get this stuff from? Because there are many spirits in this world and there are many spirits inspiring many teachers and many writers. But the Holy Spirit, the helper here, is called the spirit of truth. That is, what he teaches is dependable. It's reliable. It actually corresponds with reality. What does the Holy Spirit do? Is the Holy Spirit like a demonic spirit, like a fallen angel who just speaks on his own whim, makes stuff up on the spot, will lie any way possible in order to steal and to kill and destroy? No. What does the Holy Spirit do? He says, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. Literally, he will not speak off a towel from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit says exactly what he has heard the Father and the Son say. That is, whatever Jesus has said, you know the Father has said. And whatever the Spirit has said, you know that the Father and the Son have said. In that way, you know that all the Word of God is dependable, trustworthy, and you can depend all of your eternity on God's Word, this testimony. What will he do? Look at verses 14 through 15. This is the third aspect of the work of the Holy Spirit. Not only a convicting work and a guiding work, but also a glorifying work. He says, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Here, this third aspect of the Spirit's work, the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus by bearing witness to him, by testifying of him in the world. Now, when it says that the Holy Spirit will glorify him by testifying, by bearing witness to Jesus, what is meant there? Does it mean that the Holy Spirit is the one in our hearts saying amen, what, you, what he said about Jesus is true? I think that that is true in part. But I think that Jesus actually tells us what this means in John chapter 17, what it means to glorify He says in John chapter 17, let me read it for you, just four verses, John 17, one through four. I want you to listen how Jesus says that he glorified the Father. John 17, one through four. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that he may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all who you have given him. 
And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. How do you glorify the Father on earth? Jesus says, I glorified the Father on earth by accomplishing the work he gave me to do. How does the Holy Spirit glorify Jesus on earth? He accomplishes the work that Jesus has given him to do. And that work is to bear witness to Jesus in the world, to convict people in their heart that Jesus' way is the right way. To operate differently is sinful, but they must turn from sin unto righteousness and avoid the judgment to come. Convicting people that Jesus truly is the Son of God who died for their sins and was raised up from the dead. You see that the Spirit will glorify the Son is a guarantee. It is a guarantee that the Holy Spirit will carry out all the work for which he is sent. I want you to remember, Jesus says that this is advantageous to his disciples, that the Holy Spirit is sent into the world in his absence. Maybe this morning you need to do at least two things. Maybe this morning you need to thank the Father for sending his Holy Spirit into the world because it is the Holy Spirit who has in your life convicted you when you're wrong. That's God's mercy. It is God's Holy Spirit who's convicted you of what you've done is wrong. Thank God for that. It's God's Spirit by His plan to tell you and to guide you into all truth, to guide you into righteousness. You know that word for guide actually means to lead someone successfully to the desired location, the desired destination. Aren't you thankful that God's Holy Spirit has done that in your life? He's told you what's wrong. He's guided you into truth. He's told you what's right. He has put it in your heart to avoid the judgment that is to come. And you have believed in Jesus. How? By the work of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you need to take a moment today and thank God for this work of the Holy Spirit throughout your entire lifetime. Maybe today you need to give in to the work of the Holy Spirit. Some of you are here this morning and the Holy Spirit has been convicting you for years, for years that you are wrong. The way you've been living is wrong. The way you've been behaving and thinking is wrong. And in your heart, whereas out of your mouth you have not confessed it yet, in your heart you know you're wrong. And for years you have resisted the work of the Holy Spirit. Today, please, don't be stubborn. Give in to the work of the Holy Spirit. Because remember I told you, the Holy Spirit not only convicts us of what is wrong, he tells us what is right. And he's leading us into truth. Give in to the work of the Holy Spirit and just admit it. Admit that the way you've been living is wrong and you need to repent and turn your life around by the work, by the power of the Holy Spirit and you need to begin to follow Jesus. Maybe that's what you need to do today. As in your heart, the Holy Spirit has been testifying, hey, what he's been saying is true. What he's been saying is right. That's truth about Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit bearing witness to Jesus. Here's the question. Will you be, will you be responsive and submissive to the work of the Spirit in your life or will you continue to resist him? If you resist him, you remember the end of it. That's judgment. But that's not God's desire for you. God's desire for you is salvation. God's desire for you is righteousness and fellowship and communion with him and with his church. So this morning as I stand down front, Pastor Seth, if you'll go ahead and come with your team. As I stand down front, take this opportunity to publicly make your stand and say, I'm listening 
to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'm yielding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I have been wrong. And today I pledge my obedience in my life to Jesus. I'll be standing down front to receive you. If you're willing to follow the Lord today, I'm here. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, Lord, we pray that we would never resist the work of your Holy Spirit, but thank you that you have sent him into the world. Thank you, Jesus, for sending your spirit in the world to convict us, to guide us, and to glorify you. We pray that you would help us in all things to submit to your spirit and to follow his leadership. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.